Hi everyone, I'm really excited to be talking about the Middle Ages at a, uh, at a software convention, so uh, this is real fun for me. Um, so the reason I'm interested in the, the, this talk is kind of an intersection between my two interests of cool computer type stuff, which I like, and gnarly medieval stuff, and this is like a, this is a real fun, you know, cross-disciplinary talk. Um, another one of these, we got a heraldry, the coat of arms. Um, I'm not talking about a software library called heraldry, I'm actually talking about knights and shields and castles and stuff. Um, uh, it's this really cool intersection of graphic design, um, the Middle Ages, history, and then like a, a way of doing self-representation, and there's a lot of rules as well. So I think that's why I find it very interesting. Um, and we're going to get again into how I use software with this. Um, but before I get into it, does anyone in the audience have a coat of arms? Okay. Oh, maybe, maybe one? Huh. Oh, interesting. Uh, when I gave this talk in, um, in, SF, in uh, US Pi, uh, PyCon, um, there was a guy who had the right to use a coat of arms from his clan in Ireland. So, um, coats of arms, there's some mis, um, uh, understandings, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But um, has anyone in the audience written a, a DSL, a domain-specific language, or written a parser? All right, same guy with the coat of arms. <laughs> a couple other people. More people than have a coat of arms. So. This is about parsers, really. Um, okay, so let's get into it. Um, why did these exist? Um, so if you're wearing a full suit of plate armor, it's hard to see your face and your identifying details. So that way if you have a shield, that you can tell, oh, it's, you know, this is that king, this is this noble, noble person. It also is like, currently we have all these logos for all these companies, institutions, um, and it's sort of the Middle Ages version of a logo because um, they can't reproduce things picture perfect, like, you know, pixel for pixel. They had to have um, kind of... Uh, Boil it down in another way. So, um, as we're gonna we're gonna get into it, um, the individual logo of a coat of arms, like the individual way it's drawn, isn't the canonical way. It's actually defined in a language. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the other important thing is it allows the king to hand out honors, which is really important to the feudal society. All okay. right. So yeah, it's just like a bunch of guys in castles painting, and they can't always paint the exact same image. Um, and you also don't have like a printing press, so it's like difficult to like distribute copies of exactly how it should look like. So um, how can you kind of like control what this logo is and have it be consistent um, without those modern things? And the answer is that you actually make a DSL for it. Um, and it's called Blazon. Um, this is how um, this is how the English heraldry system did, um, did it. Um, the German heraldry system had something similar, but um, it wasn't as um, as distinctive. All right, so um, just looking at a coat of arms, so we have our, our terminology. Uh, this is the coat of arms of the UK. Um, up there, that's the crest. The crest isn't the whole thing, it's just the thing on top of the shield, the little creature up there. Oh man, I'm sorry about that. Beneath the crest, we've got the crown. And then we got the, um, the helm, which is the helmet, the mantling, which is um, just kind of like a cape that the knight would wear. It's got some supporters carrying it up. This uh, belt is the order. Then here's the coat itself. Sometimes you call the whole thing a coat of arms, but this one is the, the escutcheon. That's the real coat. Um, and then the compartment at the bottom and the motto. So there's a lot of different, you know, components and they all have different meanings. But mostly I'm going to talk, and Blazon can describe all of them, but I'm mostly going to be talking about the, the innermost escutcheon or the coat. So here's an example of a Blazon. This is the Blazon that describes, um, in a linguistic way, um, the coat arms we just saw. And if you read it, quarterly, First and fourth ghouls, three lions, passant, gardant, in pale, or armed and langered, azor. You notice that it is total gibberish. It's, um, it doesn't have sentences or any way you can understand it. It's kind of written in English, but also there's all these other words in there, um, that it seem French. It, it's, um, yeah, so we're gonna parse that. It's actually, a, yeah, it's a DSL, as I said. Um, other things about coat of arms that are, that are interesting, um, Arms are inheritable with kind of the way land is inheritable, as in, like, usually the eldest son gets it, or sometimes, you know, depending on the country, 
it's split up, but it's but it's not the same way a name is inheritable. So if you have a name, you know, my, my name is Beecham, I don't necessarily inherit the arms of the Earl of Beecham of England. Um, it, it's like a more restricted lineage. So don't get fooled by a lot of websites. And the other thing is, I, I ran into this while parsing it. This is uh, Blazon is a very consistent DSL, considering it was written over 500 years by warring factions um, in the Middle Ages. So um, um, I've had to simplify somewhat, but here we go. Um, so I'm going to introduce us to Blazon by trying to in Blazon the um, Python logo. So let's say Azure, that means blue, uh, background. Um, we got two snakes up on there. And I'm going to call them serpents because, uh, wow, uh, the myth, they, they had a, a concept of a python as a creature. It was more of like a dragon type creature. So this is more of like a servant and then, or a serpent. And then we got, we have to define the exact position of the animals. Um, so each serpent is, um, erect and then they're, um, adorsed and then inter intertwined. Um, and then um, there's uh, we have to say the colors, so that it's kind of like uh, um, kind of, these are kind of like positional arguments that um, for each of the of the things about the the serpents. Uh, and then here of the field, so this is um, actually uh, like a variable reference. So the field is azure, which is the blue background, and then the first serpent. Um, is of the field, so it's the same color as the background. So it's kind of like a variable reference that they have, where it, they, you try not to repeat a color if you already said it, you just refer back to that element. Um, and then or, the sinister inverted. So, um, great, so here let's go into, into trying to build a parser. Um, there's a lot of different parsers for Python, but unfortunately most of the parsers, there's like 40 parsers and they all seem like they were written in one weekend. Um, you know, it's like a, it's kind of, there's no one giant one that's awesome. Um, there's a lot of like, you know, kind of fun projects people thought to make. Um, so I ended up choosing this one code Lark because it seemed like it was the most supported. Um, and it also had a nice interface. Um, but the nice thing about the parsers is that almost all of them use a very similar format, which is like almost an academic format for, for giving a parser grammar. It's called the Bacchus and Hour form. Um, and uh, the nice thing also about Lark is that it supports recursion, and the heraldry language is recursive, so uh, we need that. Um, so here's the Bacchus and Hour form, um, and it's sort of like, if you like regexes, you're going to love parsing, because it's just regexes on regexes on regexes forever. Um, so, yeah, and you, you, you may sort of recognize some of these symbols. Each of these is like, a, each, uh, like we can say a lowercase letter is anything from A to C, uppercase letter is anything from uppercase A to uppercase C, a word is one or more letters. So this like plus thing you may recognize from regexes. Um, and then um, if we build this little tiny example parser, we're able to parse hello world as two, two separate words, hello and world. And the goal here is I'm just taking us from having a big string we can't read into having it as an abs abstract syntax tree, which is um, like um, tokens that we know what they are and we can start to interact with them in code. Uh, I don't know what you're going to do with hello world, but now you know it's two words. All right. So um, for the simple ones, uh, let's just talk about the, the tinctures, which are their, their word for colors. They separate them into uh, metals and, and colors, which will come up later, and they have all these strange words for them. And then, so those are all just going to be keywords, and then a tincture will be either a metal or a color. And these are important because there's a lot of rules about what colors can go with what colors. Um, so here, these are existing arms for people um, that some people, like, manage to, like, register blue as the coat of arms, and no one else could have blue. So that's pretty sweet. Um, but yeah, so we can parse these immediately. So we, it starts being useful. Here's some more complicated fields. These are called furs. They're supposed to represent like the, the fur a king would wear, an ermine. And then the interesting thing about furs is that they, they start to um, uh, have a more complex syntax. So er, um, this, uh, the ermine fur over here, um, can take two arguments for, for its uh, colors, 
um, and it's like a uh, infix, and then the, the var one, that's actually like a prefix um, syntax. So we have to kind of support that in our parser. And that this is all just totally in the language. They really use it like that. Um, so I think I have, yeah, so I have fur, tincture, and tincture, and I also have tincture, infix fur, tincture. And so um, there's no, this is the infix fur I have remained, because I've only seen that. I haven't seen very as an infix fur. But sometimes you'll like download another database of coats of arms from a different area, and then they, you know, they they use the fur in a different way or something like that. So this, I had to kind of re keep on rejiggering this as I found more examples. Um, all right, so we've got our, this is just like um, arms are a single field, field is a single tincture. Um, so now. Here's like a fully parsed abstract, abstract syntax tree for a slightly complex arms. Um, and I, we can just see that this is like, this is like a tree structure. And um, yeah, we've got um, the arms are a field, the field's a tincture, and then you know what the fur is, and then you've got the two different tinctures. So if you want to start parsing that and generating an image or something based off that, or comparing arms, you now have a, a computerized understanding of, of that a structured form. Um, which is our goal here. So if you were going to write your own DSL, that's when you can start using that to um, understand your language. So um, here's um, the next thing is ordinaries. These are like the big shapes um, that they would use. Uh, these are incredibly common. Um, these are the seven most popular, but there's hundreds. Um, there's Here's a bunch more subordinaries. Um, and then these ones can take um, any color on them. So uh, we have like Azure, a bend, very, which is the slash, very or and ghoul. So now it becomes more complex. We have this thing on this thing on this thing. Um, and uh, yeah, we start to have more complex ones. Um, here we not only have um, ordinaries, but we have ordinaries on ordinaries. And then the arms of Dolly Rimple over here. We've got ordinaries on ordinaries on ordinaries because there's a saltire of the X, and then there's the rusters, which are the white diamonds, and then oh, I, I guess I uh, th they should have a little dot on top of them. So they're the, but the point is that they can be um, arbitrarily um, complex, and some of these things become incredibly complex. Um, so let's expand our little parser to be able to handle these like recursive complex groups. Um, so uh, we've got our ordinary. It's either a big ordinary the, or a, one of the subordinary lists. And then um, we have any number of them, any color, the name of the ordinary, and then um, the color again, and then how they're arranged. And then um, if we have multiple groups, we might we might use and, or we might use comma to separate them, or we might put one on top of the other. So we're, we're just kind of building up our little parser here. Um, and this now lets us, uh, this is a, a very complex code of arms, so we're able to parse it with this parser so far. Um, and this has got our, uh, shapes on shapes on shapes. Um, and we're able to have this kind of fully recursive um, charge group and then on top of that, there's another charge group. On top of that, there's another charge group. The charges are the shapes. Um, so, yeah, that's nice. Um, so I don't know if you caught it exactly, but a uh, charge group can have a subgroup, which is a charge group. So any charge group can have another subgroup of a charge group, and it can be um, uh, recursive like that. So um, that um, allows us to, to get very complex. Um, they also have a lot of um, animals they have to draw, which uh, are basically just a whole bunch of keywords. Um, and, and each of those animals has like specific adjectives that, that um, they use for the, for the shape and the attitude of the animal. And attitudes can be many different attitudes. Um, so yeah, they have a lot of different words for like what it, what it means for a dolphin to be standing up like this or for a peacock to have its feathers out. Um, but, and then, like, it kind of matters um, certain things about if you draw an animal, 
you might draw the exact position of the animal, but then like there's some amount of uh, artistic liberties as long as it's doing the right position. So um, sometimes you know you can do a you can uh, emblazon something in MS Paint. You can emblazon it also, you know, in beautiful penmanship and, and drawing. And it's, as long as it conforms and, and follows the rules, then it's still the same coat of arms. Um, so here we got Berlin and Germany because I'm here at PyCon DE, and we're able to now parse these ones. Because uh, this one's got a bear rampant, which means that like this rampant, running rampant. And then the eagle is displayed, so that's the Bundeseagle, and it's displayed like that. So, um, yeah, it's actually kind of defined that, I don't know if, I don't think a bear can display, and I don't, and I think a bird eagle could probably be rampant, but it would look with its feet, you know? <laughs> oh, it's crazy. Alright, so getting more complex, um, we've seen recursive, um, charges on charges, but, uh, but actually any two coats of arms can be combined. Um, there's several ways to do this, but the one that became most popular towards the end was called quartering. So here's a simple quarterly sable and argent. That's uh, arms of Hohenzollern. And um, here's another one, um, Castile in Lyon, which is a really fun coat of arms because um, it's got a castle and a lion on it, and uh, it's Castile e Lyon. So they did that a lot where they do a pun, and the shape of the, the name of it is like what's on the arms. Um, so yeah, um, to, to do these uh, quarters, you just have like an entire blazon and then an entire blazon next to it, and you say quarterly. And these ones are both qu quartered, but quartering just means um, that the entire arms are represented in smaller form. It could be four, or it could be a lot more. So here's the the, the qu uh, quarter or martial arms of the entire European Union. And actually, we can see uh, up here, there's the same... Uh, coat of arms of Germany, the Bundesiegel, um, or the Reichsiegel, or whatever it's called. Um, and it actually looks totally different, but it's still a black eagle that's displayed, so it's the same coat of arms as the previous one, which was a more of a stylized GIF um, type. So yeah, um, because we already have fully defined like how each of these coats of arms would work, you know, if we want to support quartering, quartering or even nested quartering, because if you notice the arms of uh, the UK, which is still technically in the EU, <laughs> um, it's uh, quartered arms on quartered arms. Um, so it's, e it's easy to support this level of recursion uh, with just an ad one additional rule that you can have quarterly and then have any number of quarters. And each quarter is an entire group. Um, so it's easier to, uh, to write a parser for that than it would be to draw all of them. So. Um, so now this lets us um, finally parse the coats of arms of the UK, which is uh, one, one of the more complex ones. So we're able to say quarterly, and then we have three different groups. So that breaks down. Um, the first and the fourth, we have um, the field, ghouls, three lions, passant gardant, and then the, um, the, the way they're decorated. And then the second quarter, um, I'll, it's a golden field or a lion rampant um, within another charge group. So it's a charge group on a charge group. And so I have that over here. This is the abstract, abstract syntax tree that we uh, parsed from that. So we've seen that there's um, the field, and then there's a charge, the lion. And then over here, we've got um, an ordinary, which is this um, flurry, um, what's it called? Treasure, treasure, which is the... Uh, the name for the border. Um, heraldry is like 100% edge cases and like weird, only the treasure can be flurry counter flurry, for instance. But uh, anyway. Um, so let's see. The third quarter, yeah, it's, it's a simpler one. It's just the uh, harp on a, on a blue field. Okay, so getting into more complex, talking about these edge cases. So heraldry's got a bunch of rules that aren't covered by our parser. So for instance, um, this coat of arms, this red on black, is not allowed. It actually has a very low contrast, which is something that they cared about a lot. So if it's two tinctures on, on each other, it's not allowed. But if you had a metal you know, tink, um, on a, so metals are like uh, yellow and white, then that would be allowed. Um, so, and then over here, we actually have a metal on a metal, which is typically not allowed, except in the case of Jerusalem. And um, 
tincture on a metal, that is allowed. So, the, so this is called the rule of tincture, and it's really important in heraldry. But um, to, to, to do this requires a complex understanding of which shape is on which shape, um, and uh, which color is on which color, and we basically can't do it in our parser. So I just want to point out that um, there's certain understandings that you might... Um, that um, don't belong in a parser that would belong in like a, in a in a validation step after, and maybe you want to like say, hey, I can parse this, I can understand it. It just like might be invalid and and handle it differently. Um, so yeah, uh, this I only did the uh, abstract syntax tree, the parsing of it. I didn't do the outputting image because someone already did that, and um, it's also very there's a lot of edge cases, so I didn't do that part. Um, I just wanted to talk about how to build a parser. And here's the reason I'm talking about this, is because we've now seen like this full parser for how to parse grammar, for how to understand Blazon. Has anyone ever read the parse grammar for Python? It's actually shorter than the one I just wrote. Yeah, you just search Python 3 grammar and you can read it. And um, it's, yeah, it's about half as long as my heraldry grammar, because my heraldry grammar's got a lot of kinds of specific animals and uh, their positions. So like, let's just look at a little bit for Python. Um, the reason I want people to read the grammar is because I feel like you look at different Python code and you have a feeling of how you write it, but you might not know why that's allowed. And like, what are the exact um, rules that, you know, means what, what can you put in what spot or another spot? And it's a little bit of magic. And I think whenever we find magic, we should destroy it and learn what's going on instead. Um, and if you look at how simple this is, it's actually very understandable. So for an if statement, if, and then there's a test, which is going to become a Boolean, and then, and then colon, then there's a suite of what's done if the test passes. Then we have one, zero, or more L ifs, and then the optional else. So you can tell, if someone can ask you, like, oh, you know, is there a limit to the number of elifs? You could just try it out, or you could read this and figure out how it's defined. Um, if you have any questions about Python, you know, here, here are the answers, and, um, and, and sometimes you'll realize that there's a simplicity in the, uh, in the language that you don't realize. So um, here I talk a little bit about what those tests are. So uh, a test is um, an OR test, um, or a Lambda definition, and then an OR test could be an AND test, or another AND test. AND test, yeah, so these are kind of defined in terms of each, in terms of each other, but, um, uh, um, it's not, as, it's not very complex, and if you just take a minute, I don't have time right now to go through it all, but, it, it, the homework for this talk is to go and read this, you know, on the train home or something like that. Um, and you'll find out that, like, oh, it's that, that all of Python is either a simple statement or a compound statement. And then a whole function is just a bunch of statements. Um, and here's all the simple statements. Here's all the compound statements. That's the whole grammar. Um, uh, just more of this how class definitions work. And so here's an abstract syntax tree for... Um, this uh, print statement. So um, we got the start, the eval input, a uh, function call, the variable. Uh, it's, it's the print, and here's the uh, the the first argument. So you can see that, like you know, this isn't getting all the way into how this is actually understood. But if you can parse uh, Python, you can start to understand, you know, um, where mistakes could happen, or if it's not parsing, um, how that's happening. So anyway, that's the, uh, that's the point of this talk. It was to draw you in with Middle Ages stuff and then make you read the Python grammar. Thanks. And uh, this is my favorite coat of arms over here. It's the, uh, the arms of a Ru Russian closed town that... Uh, uh, Exports a lot of petroleum and I, or plutonium, and I think it's uh, really awesome. So, uh, questions about parsing or about Middle Ages stuff? Thank you so much. Uh, we have some time for questions. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, thanks for the really funny talk. Uh, spontaneous question. Would you be able to parse that coat of arms with your parser? Hmm. Probably there's um, the keyword atom that I, I haven't added. <laughs> it's tough because, like, when, you, when I was, you know, building my coat of arms, there's always, like, a, a certain fish that only lives in this guy's hometown, and he wants his fish on his coat of arms. So, as I, you know, I, I, I got to about that, in my database of coat of arms, which had, like, you know, 100,000 arms that I found. Um, I got about 70% that were being parsed. But then there was, you know, the, the, the long tail was like, oh, this guy needs a specific, you know, and this guy is an atom and no other coat of arms in the world has atoms on it, you know? So it's, it's tough to, to do a complete um, one. And the guy who, there's a guy, this um, jawshield.net website, um, th they have a similar project, a, you know, a more complete project where um, you can type in any blazon and it will render it for you. And of course, he's got the issue of like, oh, this person wants me to add a new image for, you know, yeah. It, I, I made him add a soldering iron because I wanted to have a coat of arms with a soldering iron on it. And then I realized like how many different items there are in the world, you know, and they could all be on it. Next. More questions? Thank you for the great talk. One simple question is, is it compatible with the Italian heraldry system or is just for the, in, you mentioned maybe briefly that it's just for English system, it wouldn't work with German. What uh, exactly do you support? Oh, um, <laughs> so the German, so, yeah, I was reading about this as I was coming here to, to give this talk in Germany. Um, the German system for a coat of arms, they don't have, first off, all the words are in German. Um, <laughs> so all the keywords are different. But also, it's sort of, um, it's just kind of like a paragraph that explains how to draw it. It doesn't have the like really interesting kind of like positional argument thing um, that the English, the Engl English Gal uh, Gaelic, English French uh, heraldic Herald tradition has. So they have like all the same images and stuff, but the German one would be like, if you translate it, it would be like, first draw a big red field, then put a bear on it, then say this and this, which is just in German, you know? It's like just a description of it instead of like a, like a really terse, um, is, is, is yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. But look into the Italian system because they really like recursion. So they become just a patch of random colors because it's, you have five, six levels of recursions in the, in the stuff they, they create. Another question is, um, is the, the um, renderer that you mentioned, is it implemented in Python? And if so, is your parser compatible with it? Do you plan to go, somebody's planning to, anybody's going to do that in Python? Oh yeah. Like a full um, system? So I mostly wanted this talk to be about the parsing, so I didn't I didn't touch the rendering. Um, I don't I don't think that it's, it's compatible. This is kind of it was just an exploration to see like how basically I know this place exists, but is it actually um, like uh, I didn't re like I wanted to know is it actually um, stable enough that you could write a parser for it. And then I did, and then I was kind of happy with it. And also, the more I kind of pull on it, the more edge cases you start to find, you know. I got about 60%, and then I realized, you know, the edge cases are that anything that they thought of. But but there is a, a, a good chunk that's all really standardized. Yeah. It would have been fun to go for rendering, too, but I kind of ran out of time on that. Okay, hey, uh, thanks for the amazing talk. Um, when you uh, let your par parser run on like uh, real medieval blazons, did you find any cases where the blazon was in fact ambiguous? Like where your parser found two ways of parsing the text? Oh yeah, there's all sorts, there's, um, there's a lot of ambiguous ones, um, which was tough because sometimes I would like be diagnosing an issue and be like, oh, actually it's, it could be diagnosed in, um, uh, parse many different ways. Um, specifically, like, uh, just, like, exactly um, w sometimes, like, wh what uh, uh, 
uh, objects um, are referred to by like uh, different adjectives, it is often really ambiguous. Um, another fun thing is that sometimes the Middle Ages, when they were, um, the heralds who were coming up with arms, they would use that rule of tincture that said only certain colors can be on other colors to play a game where they would make the coat of arms really ambiguous, but there's only one way to like solve it that where like, oh, this thing has to be in this one position because that's the only one that satisfies the rule of tincture. So they would um, kind of play a game with the other heralds and, and make a and and make kind of a puzzle for them. So you know, I had to run into that too. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. I learned a lot about parsing, and um, excited to see where this project goes. Thanks, um, everyone. Yeah.